and welcome to another Typo for Telemedicine webinar. Uh, this one we've got Adam Brown um, running things and Dr. Jill Weisberg Benchel uh, on the ones and twos. This is going to be a banger. Normally, this is where, hi, Christopher Snyder, community manager, Typo. This is where I run through some slides and remind you about some stuff. Um, Typo.org slash telemedicine, support at typo.org, typo.org slash webinars for all the archives and all the good stuff. Um, today's a little bit different. I'm going to give you a very brief story about when I first met Jill. Um, this was 2011. I was working at American Diabetes Association. I was part of the red shirt crew, which is that crew was part of the, the team that was staffing the, the meeting rooms to make sure that people weren't taking photos because in 2011, we thought we could prohibit people from taking photos. It was a whole thing. Um, but uh, after like four or five days of moderating these sessions and hearing about type two non-obese diabetic mice and all these like incredibly complex scientific things, my brain was just glazing over. And then on the last day of, of uh, ADA, um, of the of the conference, I was moderating a, a a room that had a bunch of different speakers talking about psychosocial stuff, and this woman got up there and started to say things like, "Diabetes is hard. You need to understand that these kids are struggling because this stuff is not easy. You need to just you know, be a human about this stuff." And it was the first time after five days of really complex science that somebody actually spoke to me, saying that they understood what the heck was going on. And I waited for all those speakers to finish, and I walked up and said, "Hi, can I give you a hug?" Um, and she gave me a hug. Yay, this is before social distancing. Um, and every year since, I've either seen her at Friends for Life or ADA, and I continue to get, I, I get my one hug. Um, and that's one of the things I have looked forward to uh, year in and year out. So I'm going to change the view here and welcome Dr. Jill and Adam. Hello, everybody. Wow, uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Christopher. I remember that hug so much. Thank that you. Was, yeah, like I said, it, I, me. yeah, after four days of like, realizing that, okay, there's a lot of science here that is not for me. Wait, here's something that is, and somebody gets it and just, yeah, it was, it was fun. And still, I, I'm always going to hold on to that story. So I'm going to hide uh, everybody else in attendance. If you have questions for Adam or Jill or me, um, use the Q and a button at the bottom of your uh, zoom webinar interface. I will pop in and ask those questions on your behalf. Other than that, Adam, have a good show. Christopher, thank you. Um, I totally agree with your sentiment about Jill as someone who gets it. And I, I think that describes her so well. Um, and Jill, you were actually going to open with uh, a little acknowledgement. So I'll hand it to you. I just thought this was an appropriate moment for us to just take just a brief moment and think about what's going on currently um, around, <clears throat> excuse me, the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters. Um, movement um, and just think for a minute about what we as healthcare professionals can do to provide better care, more thoughtful care, um, more dedicated care to our families that are black and brown, as well as our families that have other um, challenges around access to appropriate care. And just, you know, just sort of taking just a moment to think about what we can do to make a difference. Yeah. I agree. Um, so <laughs> maybe just a jarring transition. Um, when you and I were talking about doing this, one of the things that came up, I said, Jill, what, what are the sort of topics that, this was probably a month ago, what are yeah. the topics that you're seeing a lot in, in clinical practice? And immediately you said, you know, parents are having, and families, and even people with diabetes are having, grappling with this idea of like, get a 70% time in range. Oh, yeah. And, and in psychology, there's this concept of like the good enough mother or a good enough parent. Uh -huh. And then I was, it reminded me of like, ah, a good enough time and range. What is that? And how do people, you know, deal with that? And, and so I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. So I thought that was, that would be a lovely uh, place to start. Sure. Um, so I think just sort of setting the stage a little bit, um, until we had easy to use accurate CGM, which still many, many people do not use, um, and I would like to point out, based on what we said before, almost everybody that uses CGM and has access to it has um, really good insurance and is Caucasian. So we have to think about what that's about. Um, but before we had CGM um, or accurate use of CGM and easy to use CGM, 
we were talking about sort of average blood sugars, right? We would like your blood sugars to range between, let's just say 80 and 180, um, if we're in a pediatric um, population. Um, and so people thought that anything under 80 or anything over 180 was really, really bad, as opposed to we would like your mean or your average to be in that range. Because if your average is 120, that means that half the time you're either above or below 120 and only half of the time are you in there, right? And so that math concept of means and averages, it's very, it's very hard to sort of wrap your head around that. Um, and now with CGM, we're talking more and more and there's gonna be a lot of talk about it at the ADA meeting that's starting on Friday about whether or not A1C is more important or time and range is more important. And there's a good academic debate about that. But when we talk about um, time and range, when you are, you know, if your blood sugars truly are between 80 and 180, your A1C is gonna be pretty spectacular. Um, if you're there about 60 or 70 percent of the time. And one parent that I talked to about that said to me, 70 percent is a C. To me, that's a failing grade. And so she it was really very helpful for somebody to use that language for me because it was such a great example about how most people would actually think about achieving something that's in a 70 percent. Um, and for those people who tend to sign on to technologies, um, we are doing that because we want to improve our outcomes. We're dedicated to sort of achieving those glycemic outcomes for long-term health, and we're willing to take extra time, extra energy, extra effort to do that, which means a C, <laughs> a grade of a C, is not something that we're like okay with. Um, and so thinking about it not as a grade, but as something where the data is really driving, that that leads to really great outcomes. I think that that's a really hard concept. I haven't figured out the best way to present that to families so that it's really easy to understand and go home with. Um, but if we don't think about better ways to do that, I worry that we are um, inadvertently setting families up to feel guilty every time a blood sugar number is out of that target range um, and feel like they're failures. Um, and then that leads to either self-blame or it leads to um, less collaboration and problem solving and shared decision making between a, perhaps a teenager or child and their parent. Um, and that's never helpful. Yeah, well said. When when you when you see a family that is struggling with that, are there are there specific phrases that you say, or just like different ways that you try to get them to think about it beyond what you just shared? Um, I don't know if there's anything else that comes to mind. Well, one thing that comes to mind. Well, I like that you said any language because I think words matter so much. Um, so grades, you know is is big um and i think that the words good and bad you know that is a good number you're you know you oh good i'm so glad to see that you're you know you're 90 and your line is flat right um or oh that's bad um and so when we use the words good and bad it implies it's very easy for the person that has diabetes to interpret that as they are good or they are bad or they have engaged in good behaviors or bad behaviors. But Adam, you are the person that has highlighted more than anybody else for people with diabetes, the many, 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 many things over which we have no control that can impact our blood sugars. And so um, more than anybody, I think that you've really highlighted that for both providers and people that live with diabetes, to just sort of remind us, like I can do everything that my provider has told me to do five days in a row and eat exactly the same thing and exercise at exactly the same time. And I can do all of those things, but every time I look at my glyce glycemic index, whatever that is, my CGM data or a blood sugar meter data, um, my number's gonna be different. And sometimes it's gonna make sense and sometimes it's not gonna make any sense at all. Does that mean I'm bad? 
Um, so, so, you know, if we can do, I think it's just so important to just have a healthy respect for biology, totally. and how little we have control over. We have control over some things. I mean, if I decide that I am absolutely going to have an entire pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream because gosh darn it, that's the kind of day I had and I'm doing it and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm certainly going to make adjustments in the insulin that I take, but I'm probably not going to be able to thread the needle. My number is probably going to be higher than I would do a happy dance for, but I've made that choice. I understand why my numbers are that way. Um, but most of the time, we, we don't know why. And so to say to especially a teenager, you're high, what did you eat? <laughs> you know, and the teenager looks and says, I ate the lunch you packed me today. <laughs> Um, you know, so, so just by asking that question, it, it's an invitation for non-collaboration. It's an invitation mm -hmm. for not working together. It's an invitation to say almost, um, whatever the outcomes are that don't make me happy as your parent, I'm going to blame you for. Um, and that has a sense of shame and badness that comes with it. Uh, and diabetes is hard enough. Like we, and life is hard enough. We don't need to add more barriers to being together as a team. Yeah, I can go on and on. <laughs> no, I, I I love it. I I feel like because providers generally don't wear CGM, <laughs> and if they do wear CGM, they have a functioning pancreas that releases insulin in seconds. Generally, unless they have type one diabetes, um, in which case it's different. But it's hard to appreciate the complexity and number of decisions that people with diabetes have to make like on a daily basis. And it's like, you know, splitting, spinning like all these plates and you just have to like keep all the plates up mm -hmm. and we have life to live too. And I, I think it's, it's just so hard. And then of course, like the, the interconnected web of things that happens, you know, so how sleep impacts stress, impacts food choices, and then the you know the positive feedback loops start to happen, and so um, it's it's just really hard to to stay in range because of the tools that we have, and the tools we have are wonderful, and yet they are also not not a functioning pancreas. <laughs> exactly right. So to that point, hi friends, uh, we got a question in from from Pilar. Thank you, Pilar. Um, I'm just gonna read this out here. Um, so Pilar, Pilar uh, founded uh, and, and directs an NGO in Panama. Nine percent of our members are children and teens on NPH and regular insulin twice a day, and a limited number of test strips, five per day if they're lucky. Um, so to Adam, your comment or to the broader conversation topic right now around access to tools and how that can facilitate um, discussion around targets, what would be a helpful or healthy conversation to have around targets given those limited resources? And this would obviously could expand to you know a, a, a wide variety, a wide um, swath of the population of people with diabetes uh, currently today. So where, where does the conversation go given that? What a good question. Yeah. So before we had analog insulins, everybody was on regular and NPH. Um, it's harder, it's a harder road, right? And it's a harder road for a couple of reasons. I, let me be clear, I am not a physician. I am just a psychologist. So I want to just sort of make sure that your question that you also ask to people that are um, diabetologists, um, because what I know is not as much as what they know. I want to be really clear about that. But I do know that it is less predictable how you absorb and how um, your insulin is used when you're on regular and for sure for NPH. So NPH could start working in four to six hours and it might work in three and it might work in seven. And so how you're timing your food to match your, when your insulin is peaking, it's just much harder to predict so having unexpected excursions in your, in your blood sugars is just more common. Um, so diabetes in some ways is just harder because of that. Um, so um, I, I, th I think just being honest with families about what's a reasonable expectation and speaking to their experiences, they're like, oh my God, yes, that's so true. Sometimes, you know, it's clear that the NPH is peaking, you know, in four and a half hours and sometimes it's not. I mean, all of a sudden I have a low or, you know, I have a high that I didn't expect. 
Um, I, I think that the most important thing is just being honest about expectations and not having people feel like somehow those odd glycemic excursions are because of something they've done wrong. Yeah, and I, I love that. And I think this is also why I have sort of mixed feelings about like the one size fits all target of like, oh, you should get a 70% time and range because I feel like if, if someone's not on CGM, let's say they are on analog insulin, but they're not on CGM, like what an unfair target because they only, I, I often describe diabetes as like you're driving a car. The goal is to keep the car on the road. Um, if you, you know, 70% time in range, like I'm on the road 70% of the time. But to me, like glucose monitoring is the windshield. And so if you only get to look out the windshield five times a day, <laughs> you only get five opportunities to see where you're at on the road. And so like trying to stay on the road for most of the day is going to be really difficult. And I feel like in all of the discussion around time and range goals, there's almost no discussion of what tools people have access to, to get to different levels of time and range. And the result is if you have older tools or less access to newer tools, it puts more pressure on you to be like hyper regimented um, like you were just describing because I feel like most diabetes tools have sort of offered us more flexibility, like more time and range with a little more flexibility and mm -hmm. versus some of the older tools, like just put more pressure on you as the person with diabetes to be really on top of it all the time. It's, it's humanly impossible to be really on top of it if you only have five opportunities or less, even if you had seven opportunities to know where your blood sugars are. You have no, I mean, the, the to me, one of the most beautiful things about the opportunity to use an accurate CGM is the predictive algorithms, right? It gives you an opportunity to tell you where it's predicting that you're going in the near future, which gives you an opportunity to do something before you get to that outcome. If you don't have that opportunity, then everything is reactive. Nothing is proactive. Um, and so um, I think it was Peter Adelson that said to use your, um, who's a wonderful pediatric endocrinologist in Gothenburg, Sweden. And he talks about that idea of driving your car, but the only way that you can drive it is by looking through the rear view mirror. Like how are you supposed to stay on the road <laughs> and go forward if you're always looking backwards? Um, and so, um, yeah, so what, you, Time and range is almost a silly concept um, if you only have four or five opportunities to see a static number and you have no ability to get on top of things um, before they happen. So for something like that, whenever you're having, um, when access to tools and technology is limited, is it better to focus on uh, establishing good habits and less on and less specifically on the results, like if, if a 70% time and range is not realistic for a variety of reasons, is it better to focus on, okay, like you've got these five test strips, let's work on testing five times per day, focus on establishing those good habits. So at the very least you can create a positive, some sort of positive relationship with your diabetes management, given all the other variables that could be uncertain um, for a variety of, of reasons around all that. Sure. I'm going to remember we said language matters. I'm going to say checking blood sugars instead of testing because you can't. Okay all-nighter to get the number that you want and there's no a's or f's in blood glucose numbers so i'm just going to throw that out there um but also i think um if you have an opportunity to check glucose five times a day most i think endocrinologists would, would ask for a blood sugar check before each of your three main meals of the day so that you know where you are and you can think about both what your carb counts are and where you are and, and dose a short act, a shorter acting insulin um, more accurately to address that. Um, but then that's three out of five. So when are the other two day, times of the day that would be most informative? And so that's an opportunity for collaboration between the provider and the person with diabetes. If you were gonna get one more bit of data that you could really use that would help you what time of day would you like to have that? And that might change from week to week or day to day or month to month or as different things in your life change. Um, but I, so I would, I would use that as an opportunity to really think about if I'm gonna gather data, um, how am I gonna make the most use of the data that I have the opportunity to gather? I, I, think, I think that's lovely. And um, 
one of the other things you made me think of is, you know, most of us tend to eat the same like 20 meals. Right. Um, so maybe at least there's an opportunity to kind of do a pre, a before meal and after meal and sort of just figure out like how to reduce variability around meals, I think can go a long way in improving time and range. Um, and again, like, like you said, if you're using three before meals and maybe one at bed, like you still have one floating blood sugar that you kind of do after different meals of the day over time uh, to kind of just get a sense of how things are going. So yeah, it's still, it's still tough, but it's not. Uh, people have lived more years without CGM than we have with CGM. So it's, it's possible to live a long and healthy and productive life without CGM. And we just, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give a shout out to one of my dear friends who's a brilliant um, diabetes nurse educator named Natalie Bellini. Uh, Natalie and I've worked together for many years in a variety of contexts. And um, one of her many gifts is that she's not only brilliant, but she's funny, um, which makes everybody want to be with her. And what Natalie taught me is the idea of owning a meal. So let's say that I really, really want to own and her example, I believe, was um, personal pan pepperoni pizza, right? If I want to own that and be able to know um, that I can dose exactly for that to manage my numbers, it might take me three or four times to eat that same meal until I figured out two, three hours later that I actually have an outcome, a blood sugar number that makes me feel like I dosed appropriately for that meal. And now you've owned that particular meal. And so if you just sort of think about these 20 foods that you tend to eat around, you know, on average, and you just take the time to own each of those 20 meals, you know, in two months time or so, if you're really dedicated to that, if that's something you want to achieve, you're going to own each one of those meals. Yeah, I love and that. that. Because of all of the things that you've taught us, Adam, it's not going to always make sense, right? Yes. Because there are other things like sleep and stress and humidity and um, all kinds of other things that are going to where I am hormonally, right? So, you know, like everything, there's so many things that we can't stop. If I'm in the middle of puberty and I'm growing, you know, all bets are off. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, so you do the best you can and control, if it's important to you, what you can or gather the knowledge that you are able to over the things that you have a little bit of control over, but the rest of it, we have to just like, you know, it's just the day. It's just yeah. a moment in time and you have other moments. Yeah. I Easy love to that. Say I... to somebody that doesn't um, have to, <laughs> one, by the way, it's easier for me to say that because my pain. <laughs> well, well, you reminded me of this notion in, a lot of um, like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is this idea of running behavioral experiments. And I think that that can be so valuable in diabetes to just be like, huh, I'm gonna run an experiment. Like, I wonder what happens if I blank. And there's almost no end to those experiments. And I, I, think, oh, wow. that, I think that framing can often take some of the pressure off, like I have to get X time in range. And if I don't, I am a, negative whatever because it's like oh i'm gonna try something see what happens if it works great i'll do more of that if it doesn't work i'll do less of that and glucose monitoring is sort of my guide in that process mm -hmm. and of course in science like experiments go wrong for all sorts of reasons which also happens in diabetes and so yeah, well I, I wouldn't say it goes wrong i would say that no matter what even if it's not the outcome that you expected you learn something from it yes so, well you know, I, and I don't remember the exact quote, but it's a wonderful, you know, when Thomas Alva Edison was interviewed by somebody and she asked him how many experiments it took before he invented the light bulb. And I forget what it was, but it was like, you know, 2,300 experiments. And she said, you failed 2,300 times. And he said, no, I learned 2,300 ways how not to make a light bulb. So, <laughs> um, you know, but, but it's that kind of attitude that allows us to keep going. So no matter what we learn something, from those experiments that allows us to make different decisions. Yeah, and I, I think that framing also helps like with acceptance of the unpredictability because sort of like wishing diabetes was more predictable can create like all of this psychological exhaustion versus accepting like, oh, it's, it's actually given that this will be unpredictable. And my hope is to learn some things that work to ideally make it less, less unpredictable, more predictable.
Yeah, I mean, if we could get all teenagers to experiment about the difference between pre-bolusing for a meal 15 or 20 minutes before they eat versus bolusing when they sit down and just see what happens to their blood sugars after, I mean, that, that would be amazing. <laughs> if we could get all teenagers to pre-bolus, oh, it would be like, you know, we do right. like public health improvement. Yeah. But it's so, hard. I mean, right? It's, it's hard. hard. Running, well, and that's one frustration yeah, I have. It's like, it's hard to run experiments on your own diabetes. Like it takes its own level of motivation and effort and diligence and, you know, tracking by hand or taking a photo or taking a screen, you know, it's like, it's not easy to do that. So no, that's, that's a whole nother piece. Opening yourself up to an invasion of your privacy. If you're taking a screenshot, if you're sharing your data, even if you're um, merely bringing, and this is in the mirror, but even if you're bringing a blood glucose logbook to your provider, four times a year. You are opening up to somebody else, intimate parts of who you are, and you're giving them the opportunity to judge you. That, that's a huge leap of faith and trust on the part of the person with diabetes and those that love them. That's really hard and really overwhelming. Um, and I think as providers, we have to be way more humble about that. So to that collaborative nature, um, Pilar is actually back with a follow-up question. Um, he attended a recent, uh, recent uh, Friends for Life um, in Orlando and saw you speak. And uh, he said, you mentioned a study comparing families that collaborated a lot with their children's self-care, uh, others who collaborated some, and others who collaborated very little. Uh, the best results, um, according to the study that you had talked about, um, the best results came from families that collaborated partially. He's asking if you can share a little more about that study. He also asked for um, some follow-up references that I'm going to share his email address with you after the, after I, the webinar. On, I have to after. honestly say I don't remember which study that is. So it was okay. clearly not my data. Um, so I was, I was definitely um, sharing somebody else's. But I would be delighted, Pilar, to look that back up and get that reference to you for you. Um, but it, if, if we just take a step back from that study, there are people that are very, very, parents that are very involved in their kids' diabetes care to the point where they're almost intrusive. Um, sometimes we'll call that helicopter parenting. I had one brilliant teenager say, no, 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 we don't helicopter anymore. Those parents are now drones and they get like right in, um, which I just thought was like, like I learn everything from the people I work with. I just sound smart sometimes because I share other people's brilliance. Um, but that was just like, that was amazing, right? So if you're that, over involved if you're that controlling that intrusive then we do see worse outcomes um, in part because then there is a conflict between who owns the diabetes and whose body is it um, whose diabetes is it and if the conflict is around but this is my life and you're not me then it's almost impossible to collaborate around this thing that nobody's chosen that is actually not a definition of who you are as a person or what you're able to achieve. Um, and so if diabetes is not in some way, shape or form externalized as something that everybody's working on together, even if it's a human being's pancreas that isn't making enough insulin, am I making sense here? Um, but if, if, if um, cor correct me or ask for clarification if I'm not being clear, but if, if, it's very easy to set the stage then for all kinds of conflict around who's in control or whose body is it. Um, and that's not helpful. So if it's that kind of intrusive sort of drone parenting, the outcomes are not great. Similarly, if the parent says to um, a teenager, I've been doing this long enough, I'm tired, um, you're getting to the age where you have to start taking on responsibility. I'm not going to be around all the time anyway. You need to start taking this on your own. Here, it's yours. That also leads to poor outcomes. Um, so it is indeed the balance between the two. The recognition that you have a growing human being who is developing emotionally and cognitively and with specific skill sets and is beginning to develop the ability to become more independent and more self-sufficient. But there will always be times in a person's life, at least at the age of 25, and I would suggest even past that, where there are just hard days, there are hard times, there are competing demands. And so even if you know what you should be doing, whatever that means, it's harder to do it. 
And so having the open, collaborative, respectful relationship where at any point in time, the person with diabetes can look at their parent and say, I can't do it today. Today is super hard. I need you to take over or I need your help or I need you to guide me. And for that parent to be able to say, I am so delighted that you asked for that. It would be my pleasure to be there for you without going like, oh, are you irresponsible or here you go again or you're never going to be independent or any of that kind of negative messaging. If it's a true collaboration um, and it's a true partnership, it's a true teamwork then um, the data is very clear. It's not just one study, there's tons of data on this, that children and teenagers do better and that those people who had that collaboration when they were living in their parents' home and they've now moved off to their first job in their first apartment or they've moved off to college and they're living in a dorm, they do better. They do a better job of engaging in daily self-care tasks so that they're biologic outcomes, their glycemic outcomes are better, but also their psychosocial outcomes are better. Beautifully said. Okay. Um, I, I actually want to pull on two threads because I, I think um, people may not be familiar with them. So um, in school, when I learned about narrative therapy, I thought this idea of, I'd never heard of this idea of externalizing the problem. And I'm hoping you could explain that to folks because I don't think that is explained in diabetes. And I think it is so, so powerful, this idea of saying like, it's not that I'm a diabetic, it's that we're battling the diabetes together and it's something separate from me. And then we can externalize it and, and we can both collaborate on it. And um, yeah, maybe you could just share a little bit more about that because I think people may not know about this kind of concept. Well, I think you just explained it. So I don't know. Sorry. What to add. No, I mean, that's, it, that's exactly right. So um, we tend to personalize um, our challenges, um, whether it's diabetes or not, right? Um, it's my anxiety. It's my depression. It's my learning disability. It's my whatever. It's my diabetes. It's, um, and when we do that, oftentimes we take on this belief system that therefore it is ours and our job and our job alone to solve it, to fix it, to take it on. And if we ask for help, somehow we are weak. Somehow we are burdening those that love us. Somehow we are asking more than we should be asking. And that leaves us very vulnerable. Right, and so think about, actually, I'm gonna ask you to think even a little bit about um, the young adult who's starting their first serious relationship, and they're thinking, this might be the person that I wanna partner with for the rest of my life, right? If you have a pancreas that's not making insulin, there are all kinds of things that you have to think about, about how you're going to allow that person into that part of who you are, um, and I have heard so many adults say, I've never asked my partner to learn about diabetes. I've never asked them to treat a low. I've never asked them to change an insertion set. I've never asked them to check a blood sugar or give me an injection because it's my diabetes and I don't want to burden them with it. And um, I once asked a person um, when we were talking about it, why they were not willing to give their loved one the opportunity to join and share in caring for them and showing how much they love them and why were they preventing them that opportunity to just have another way of loving that person and that person was like so surprised at that perspective it was like what do you mean like what do you mean i'm like preventing this partner of mine from like loving me and i was like yeah, you're actually you actually are i want you to think about that um, because if that person has chosen to love you and share their life with you, they want all of you, all of you, the good, the bad, the ugly. If you are truly a partner with somebody, you want all of them and you love them for everything that they have and everything that they bring to the relationship. You might not like all of it, but you love it. And um, so I, I think that um, that was I think that we have to sort of look at diabetes as external to us because otherwise it increases our risk for being sad, for feeling lonely, um, for feeling stuck, um, for feeling shamed, um, for feeling overwhelmed. And pretty much 
everything, I think everything, somebody's gonna come up with something where I'm wrong, but everything is easier if we do it shared. Life is, life is hard enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think tying that all back to the, the first thing we talked about, about time and range, when you have, when I have a day where time and range is not what I hope for, if diabetes is external to me, that's a different psychological experience than if I am my diabetes and my time and range is not oh, yeah. where it is. And so oh, I yeah. think there's also like some beauty in that approach to dealing with it. Yeah, you have much less shame, much less guilt, much less sort of second guessing everything that you've done and what did you do wrong and where did you go wrong, right? But just, okay. So today, diabetes really sucked, <laughs> you know? Um, and, um, you know, is there, and you can always look and see, you know, is there something I could be doing differently tomorrow? Or is there something I learned about what was particularly awful or frustrating or annoying today? And you might go, nope, there was nothing. It was just one of those days. Okay, but tomorrow's a new day, right? And, but if, if, if it's not external to you, if it's all yours, if you own all of it and you're doing it completely on your own, then it's easier to feel shamed and sad and burdened and overwhelmed and angry at yourself. I don't know where that gets you. Somewhat related, a question from Karen. Thank you, Karen. Uh, can we hear more about stubborn teens and how much to let uh, the teen handle their own or handle things on their own when they're irresponsible? For example, when they're sneaking sweets or, or lying about um, things that they've done in relation to their diabetes management. So um, teens don't treat diabetes any differently than any other parts of their lives. So I think that's the first thing to just think about is diabetes is just one piece. Um, and they developmentally are absolutely trying to become more and more independent and self-sufficient in every single aspect of their lives, they're gonna make mistakes. They're gonna make huge mistakes. The question is how do we, how do we respond to those mistakes? Um, I like to say things like, huh, so what'd you learn from that? Um, you know, how'd that go for you? <laughs> that uh, going to a party where there were no grown-ups and the police came. How'd that, how'd that, you know, how'd that, how'd that turn out? Like, you can do that again? You know, what'd you learn from that experience? So it's, um, it's, it's not just diabetes stuff. So um, I think that's one thing to just sort of have a realization that even though as grown-ups, especially as parents, the importance of tight control is very important. It's um, a very important part of what parents and providers think about, especially diabetes providers. And that's what we do, right? We live diabetes and we try to help. So it's very important to us. But diabetes is only one part of everything for our teenagers. So I think that it's just important to sort of have that perspective. I think it's important to have the perspective that adolescence is not a chronic illness, <laughs> that people actually grow out of it. Um, and um, that teenagers are more primed from the brain development to go for what feels good long before the part of their brain is developed that lets them know that things are risky. So sort of that part of your brain that's like, ooh, that was cool, let's do it again. Um, and that is, you know, it, it is well developed long before the part of our brain that goes, you know what, that was really a uh, not brilliant plan and I don't think I want to do that or it could place me at risk. And that, that doesn't really, that's not really well developed until we're closer to 25. So adolescence is actually from about 12 or 13 to about 25. Um, and I think it's really important for providers and parents to understand that. So people, they're going to go through ebbs and flows. Um, uh, the other thing I think is we have to be really, really clear as both providers and parents what our expectations are. Like, where are the hard lines? Um, so parents, I think it's very important for them to be really, really clear about their beliefs and expectations around alcohol and drug use, their expectations about academics, um, about going to school, about completing homework, their expectations about who their friends are, their expectations about whether or not there's a curfew on their expectations about sexual activity. Like parents need to be really, really clear about their expectations and why, what their beliefs and what their values are, because 
those parents' voices are in the back of their kids' heads as they're about to maybe do something that their parents were like, yeah, we don't do that in this family, and let me tell you why. So it will inhibit some of those behaviors, but it's not going to prevent all of them. Yeah, there's a follow-up comment from Karen saying that most teens and children are not planning or thinking of the future. They're more about you know, things not. in the moment. And of course, that, I mean, that applies in the moment in, in like a sort of a 15 minutes from now, but also five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from oh, now, yeah. and you like oh, every yeah. now and then, like when you're diagnosed, like the first thing you're told is don't go on the internet because you're going to see, you know, pictures of amputated feet. Um, because, you know, diabetes is weird like that. So like thinking about like those long-term complications is a whole other thing. And then thinking about the, um, the impact of your decision-making, you know, 10, 15, 30 minutes from now, an hour from now, whatever, um, like that sort of thought process is going to be uh, a, a challenge to try and communicate at times. Um, I imagine uh, to a teenager when you're trying to help them figure this stuff out. Oh yeah, no, I, I, there's no utility in talking about, do you know how what you're doing now is going to impact your health when you're 50, right? Um, because 50 is gray hair and old and wrinkles and almost dead. So don't talk about that because they're not interested in it. But if you're gonna, if you, so if you're gonna, if your goal, let's say for example, if I'm a clinician and I'm working with a person who has a fairly significantly high A1C, let's say 12, right, or 13. Um, I know that it's very likely that they're not sleeping through the night because they have to get up to pee. Because when you're running blood sugars that high, you gotta pee a lot, okay? So most people would really like to sleep through the night. So if I don't say, oh my God, your A1C is 13, do you know what you're doing to your eyes and your kidneys and don't you care? They're not, then, then also I'm like, wah, 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 and they're gonna completely ignore me. But if I say, I'm just wondering if you wake up a lot in the middle of the night to go pee. And they're going to be like, oh my God, how do you know that? Well, I'm just wondering, like, is that cool for you? Does it bother you? Would you like to try to sleep through the night? Well, yeah, that would be great. Okay. So would you be willing to partner with me to try to change a couple of things, like between dinner time and the time you go to bed to figure out if we can help you sleep through the night? It's going to take a couple of weeks for us to work on this. Um, but are you willing to join me in that trial? Now I've invited them, I've got them signed on. I haven't said anything about long-term health. I haven't said anything about blood sugars. All I've done is say, I want you to sleep through the night. And it's yeah. more likely that I'm gonna get them to connect with me around that. Does that make sense? So lovely. Yeah. Uh, you made me think of, of two things, Jill. The first is um, appealing to something that a teenager cares about. So sleeping through the night or it could be you know if they're really into video games like my reaction times are better when my blood sugar's in range or they really care about basketball like i'm a, i'm a better basketball player better than I'm in. and so so that was one piece that i thought you really crystallized um and then the other was even just the way that i think you uh, role played that a little bit was like you are on the same level as the as the client or the teenager like would you partner with me rather than talking down to them about long-term health or long-term complications like the expert and i i feel like that is um often a hard thing for folks to wrap their heads around if they're used to always like talking down to someone yeah, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think about a time as a provider when it is really effective if I present myself in that hierarchical manner where I have the expertise and I'm going to sort of school you on what to do. Um, so even if, I mean, even at, as um, a person who sometimes needs to access healthcare myself, I wouldn't want to work with a provider that presented themselves as like all knowing and all knowledgeable and they were just gonna like give me their brilliance for a little bit and I'd better listen to it and I better not question it and then they were gonna go away. Like that isn't somebody that I would wanna partner with. So yeah, yeah, I, I think that um, respecting, that's about respect, right? It's respecting the person's lived experience that's in your office. Um, and I don't know what their challenges are. Um, I don't know um, whether or not they are living in a safe neighborhood with a safe school. Uh, well, I mean, I tried to find that out, but when they're first walking in, I don't know whether or not mom or dad just lost their job. I don't know if grandma's sick and in the hospital. 
I don't know if they're struggling with an academic subject that was never hard before. I don't know if they're experiencing some kind of um, relationship drama or abuse, right? So there's so many things like, I don't know about their life above and beyond diabetes. Um, so diabetes is just one part of who they are and their family, their community, um, their challenges. And so to sort of come in as sort of, with that hierarchical attitude, they're never gonna trust me to share who they are and what their lives are, and I'll never be able to join them to problem solve what they're interested in working on. Adam, I've got a bunch of questions that have popped in, if you're okay with me I'm driving for a little bit. This one is in from Danielle, it's sort of a two-parter. Um, in talking with um, patients or people who are living with type one and type two, specifically about children and teens that she's working with. Um, we noticed that most of them are going through really hard mental issues um, and they're having problems trying to convince their parents, parents of these teens and kids, um, to look for psychological support for both uh, their children and themselves um, as the parents. Uh, what can you uh, advise in terms of trying to cross that barrier and persuade them to look for extra help? Um, and sort of related to that, like uh, potentially how does this sort of factor into uh, evaluating um, diabetes related to stress or burnout. Um, Cause that can also be sort of like a triggering sort of thing that can contribute to that need for additional support. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, great questions. So I suppose I can put a little bit of my advocacy hat on. Um, most diabetes programs don't have a behavioral health specialist that's integrated into their clinic. Um, but they have a dietitian that's integrated into their clinic and they have a nurse educator that's integrated into their clinic. And I don't know how you live well with diabetes. Now, again, I'm biased. I'm a psychologist, but I don't know how you live well with diabetes without having that aspect of the overall toll that diabetes takes on your life and on those that love you without having somebody to partner and talk about that part as well. Um, so if there is a way to advocate to have embedded behavioral health specialists, social workers, master's trained psychologists, PhD, so it doesn't matter. Um, but to have somebody that is trained in the behavioral health aspects of the everyday burdens of diabetes, um, so that it's a model of from diagnosis and through your lifespan, you have ups and downs on that journey and you have people to partner with you to help you learn new strategies if the ones that you've been using aren't working anymore. So. Um, I think that that's one plug. Um, the other is it's certainly a challenge because parents, well, many people have all kinds of beliefs and thoughts and feelings about the stigma related to seeking behavioral health. Um, sort of that means that I'm crazy. That means there's something wrong with me. That means that I'm not a good enough person. I'm not independent enough. I can't solve my own problems, right? And so there's all of that. I'm not crazy. Um, and so that makes it really, really hard to access care. Another thing that makes it really, really hard to access care is most insurance companies, even great ones for medical care, have a separate carve out for behavioral health. And so it's harder and harder to find people that might have hours that are convenient for you, um, that have the skill sets that you need where you can access their services. Um, and that's a huge problem. Um, a tiny little silver lining in the life that is COVID is that almost every behavioral health specialist in the country now has telehealth sessions um, that are being covered by insurance. And so if you really want to advocate, write to your insurance company and say you'd best continue covering telehealth um, because people can access it in a much more convenient time and space. So you're not taking more time off from work. You're not traveling. You're not paying for parking. Um, all of those things that just make it harder and harder to access care. Um, so th th that's just some thoughts. Two other things um, related to that question. Um, one is it's okay for non-behavioral health trained clinicians, nurse educators, and diabetologists and endocrinologists to ask people how they're doing. It's okay for you to take a minute or two and just say, hey, diabetes is really hard. How are you doing? Um, people are so, so appreciative of being asked, but a lot of providers are afraid because they don't want them to have to all of a sudden hear that somebody is maybe suicidal or is clinically depressed because they don't know what to do about it. But that hardly actually ever happens. Um, and boy, if it does happen, you'd best know how to help somebody that really needs 
more support. Um, and so reaching out to whatever group that you partner with to have better connections and referral resources is important. I love it. Just, just a couple of things I wanted to add. Um, most therapists will do like a 15 minute or 20 minute, like free phone in consult, like initial thing. And I think like, oftentimes when I find myself like making a giant mountain out of something, like if I can just shrink it to something that feels like, oh, I'll give that a shot. Like that helps me get over that initial hump. That's and so I feel like. Experiment idea, right? That's having. Yeah. So like, can you, if they, if they're, it can be tempting to say like, I'm either doing, you know, years of therapy or no therapy at all. And it's like, all right, well, what can I, can I start with like a 10 minute call? Like, could it, could I do that? Um, the behavioral health point I think is awesome because um, a lot of therapy is done over telehealth now and you can like do it at home and there, there might be no copay at this time right now. So it's a, a lovely time to do it. Um, and I feel like, I mean, because I'm in school to be a therapist, like, I've gone to therapy because like, it's so recommended for therapists to go to therapy. And, and, but even I found myself like struggling to like find the right provider and like a little nervous before the first session. Like it is a big thing to go to therapy. But on the other hand, like people like Jill, you are trained in psychology and behavior and teaching people skills. And I, I feel like that's how I think about this stuff is like, you're learning new skills, you're learning new toolkits, you're learning different ways to solve problems rather than like you have mental health issues and you're broken and you need to go get those fixed. It's like, Oh no, like I could, I could use a little, like a different way of thinking or a different skill set or a different toolkit. And I, I think that's what um, these sorts of things can offer. And also it's also just okay to just have really, really, really big feelings about tough times like it's okay and yeah no shame in having like a lot a lot of sadness or a lot a lot of worry or both at the same time um it, that's okay and it doesn't mean that you're crazy and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you um and there are of course people that truly do meet criteria for an anxiety disorder um, or a depressive disorder. And when I use the word disorder, I mean that it's clinically impacting their ability to function every day. That still is nothing to be ashamed about. It's just there's amazing treatment. Um, and so to me, the perspective is there's no reason for anybody to suffer when there's great um, treatments available, whether it's sort of more um, support and learning skills or it's more intensive and even requiring, you know, perhaps medication for support. There's still amazing empirically supported treatments available. Nobody should have to hurt alone. Diabetes or not. Amen. Uh, question in from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, um, who actually is, she indicated in her question, she's a registered nurse, diabetes educator, or diabetes care and education specialist, excuse me, and a school nurse. Um, question for Jill, what do you feel are the most helpful things that nurses, school nurses can do um, for the students with diabetes on a daily basis? First, oh my God, you're a school nurse and a diabetes educator. That is amazing. So I love you wherever you are, and I wish we had a lot more of you. Um, that's just so unusual and so, so cool. Um, I, I think that you have an amazing opportunity to touch base with these young people on a daily basis. So get to know them as humans um, and ask probing questions um, that they can then think about and get back to you another day with an answer. Um, I wonder like, you know, what happened on those two days and why the other days were different. Do you have any ideas about that? Can you go back and think about that and let me know what you think? Because I would like to learn from you. So sort of being um, curious and um, getting to know them and their lives. I think actually school nurses can get to know these young people better, more intimately than any of their other typical diabetes providers who see them four times a year for like 15 minutes at most like that. And hey, if you need some sort of a tool to help review what might have happened in the past, I've got a free resource for you. Type yeah. org. There you go. Okay. Um, I, had, I feel like I have to find one plug in there. That was the best I can do given the quality of this content that was focused That was on, lovely, Christopher. That was lovely. Side. But if you announce the segue, then it doesn't really count, does it? Uh, question in from Christy. Thank you, Christy. Do you advocate for us as providers meeting with a teenager without the parent in the room at times if there are some conflicts? 
Absolutely, whether there's conflicts or not. So the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends that providers, healthcare providers, subspecialists and general pediatricians meet alone with their teenagers starting at the age of 12 for at least a few minutes at each visit. And so what's that, what that is doing, and it might just be literally, hey, I just wanted to meet with you alone and see how you're doing. Is there anything you'd like to share with me without your mom or dad hearing it? To like when they're much older, having most of your visit with the teenager alone. What you're doing over time is you're helping the teenager build a skill set where they become a better advocate for their own health care. They are going to learn how to have conversations and ask questions with their health care provider um, without worrying about somebody else hearing it or judging it. It's a great time to talk about drugs, alcohol, sex. Um, and all of those are important to talk about if you're a diabetes provider, um, not just if you're a general pediatrician or a family um, physician. Um, and, you know, um, so what, whether, whether family dynamics are gorgeous and awesome and amazing or whether they are really conflict laden, I encourage every provider to have alone time with their teenagers at every visit. All right, one last question in and then I'll let you uh, and Adam have the final word here. This is a comment from Karen who um, sort of following up on a previous comment you had made um, saying that she hasn't been able to find any mental health support for diabetes, um, I guess where she lives within her network. Um, and our doctors don't have recommendations for therapists with diabetes skill sets. My insurance doesn't even have a category for therapists that help with diabetes or diseases. The question I'm going to ask on her behalf is, how do you, Jill, and your peers sort of get the word out that you, know, that you exist, that you are a resource that can be leveraged whenever um, so many folks within that primary care spectrum, be it a primary care physician or an endocrinologist, don't think about the diabetes related skill set that can come um, with being a bit, you know, a, a diabetes psychologist and things like that. Yeah, so um, the American Diabetes Association and the American Psychological Association partnered a couple of years ago and they've developed um, training um, for mental health trained providers to get diabetes specific expertise. And they've run probably about 10 of those um, programs, it's a two day program. Um, over the past few years. And um, I think each one has had almost 100 providers participate. And then after they've completed that training, their name and their information is put on the American Diabetes Association website. So you can go to diabetes.org and you can look for their mental health, or I think it's called mental health provider list. I don't think it's called behavioral health provider list. And you can put in a zip code and it will tell you who the providers are within like a 20 mile radius, a 50 mile radius, a 100 mile radius. Um, so that's one way to at least have some confidence that you are referring your patients to somebody that does have some diabetes specific expertise and training. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, especially if you work in um, pediatrics, is a lot of the general pediatricians in your community actually have a pretty good relationship with those therapists that are really good with either children or toddlers or teenagers. And so reaching out to some of those really highly skilled and highly respected therapists and saying, hey, listen, we know that you don't have expertise in diabetes, but you have an amazing reputation in our community. Would you be willing to allow us to train you a little bit in some of the unique aspects of diabetes so that we can then start referring some of our patients to you? And if that's a person that's in private practice, they are gonna want that line of referrals and they're gonna be delighted to join you and partner with you. Um, so that's just another way to increase um, the ability to partner with people that are well-trained and good general clinicians. Yeah, and, and just one thing you made me think of that I wanted to add, Jill, is that I, I think the research in therapy sh shows that the relationship is the most important thing in terms of like, it's, it's less about, I mean, what the therapist does is important, but it's not as important as the relationship between the therapist and the client. And so even if someone doesn't have diabetes expertise, but if you can build, if you can find someone you can build a great relationship with, then you, you can still do a lot of good work even if they don't have the diabetes expertise. And I, I think folks may not be aware of just that, how important that is. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's very heartening because 
there, there just aren't enough mental health professionals who have diabetes expertise, but there are a lot of mental health professionals out there who are really good. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And it's kind of like speed dating in some ways, like, right? Like you're going to meet somebody and be like, oh, I don't know why anybody recommended you. I don't like you at all, right? And you're like, okay, you're done, right? So that's why it's really nice to have those 10 or 15 minute consultations too, because what you're doing is you're checking out whether or not you like the person. Yes. Whether or not you want to go on a second date. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. I'm waiting for the awkward moment where Amazon is going to ring this doorbell and alert my dog. <laughs> Hang on one second. This is the joy of working from home. And then we're going to find a way to gracefully transition. Okay, he didn't ring the doorbell. That's cool. All right. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. It's uh, the top of the hour. Um, Jill, thank you for one, bearing with us with technical, uh, technical difficulties. So glad we were able to have this oh, conversation. Oh, so sorry about that. Yes. It's okay. We got it resolved. We got the conversation in the books. We should probably do more of these because it's so much, this is important stuff that we're talking about right now. Um, Adam, thank you again. Let me change the view here so everybody can actually get this proper recording. Here's everybody. Um, so yeah, this is great. Again, for everybody out there, if you're watching this in the archives, support at typo.org if you have any typo related questions. Um, and if you need to get in contact with Jill, send the email there and we'll find a way to get you back to her. Um, oh, yeah. And we'll make all that happen. Um, Adam, thank you. Jill, thank you. Everybody, stay safe. Bye -bye. Keep up the fight. Have a good day. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jill. You're amazing. Oh, so are you. <laughs>